how has the industry changed from early days to now? Like, as you were mentioning, there's a huge scarcity, even let's say 96, 97, you mentioned visual effects, like the, the special effects was still the argument of like, which is what, what at the time. And it, uh, a lot of people didn't really know until things like Jurassic Park in 93 came out or Toy Story in 95, like that's the first time you could really point and say, that's the kind of stuff that I'm trying to do or am doing, you know, whereas now, you know, visual effects is synonymous with being the problem for every single film, even though half the time it's the practical set that is what they're pointing to. Um, but how do you think uh, it has changed in terms of like smaller studios usually taking on um, a portion of the work versus all the work or smaller well, shot I, counts or less ambitious? I th you know, I think there's a difference in terms of how the visual effects artists and studios get treated. I think in them early days, ILM, you know, um, set a very good template. And as you say, you can watch the Disney Plus um, uh, series that gives you the background of the, the birth of it. And you can see they were just a bunch of really smart people that were quite rebellious and doing crazy stuff that George believed they'd actually get that, yeah? And yeah. I think that that relationship they had with George and Spielberg and Kathy and how they propagated this sense of respect for visual effects was very much for every visual effects company in the mid to late 90s where you were effectively considered magicians and it was really I think directors would be like wow it's so special that I can work with these artists to get these results and uh, one of the first movies I worked on was um Muppets Christmas Carol with my friend Yannick Sears um awesome. and um Brian Henson you know, his dad had passed away um, and Brian, it was Brian's first proper, you know, big directing gig. And, you know, we made Kermit walk, which was a miracle for the for the puppet guys that we were able yeah. to take a, I think we had him, on, obviously we, we had him on blue screen. We weren't so dumb to put him on green screen, but we had him on blue screen <laughs> and we were able to get rid of the puppeteers and put him on there. And it was, a, it was almost a tearing up moment for Brian and the, and the level of respect that he had for us. And you can see everybody that came to the shop was like, you're doing magic. I could not tell this story any other way. And this continued through the matrix and the, the late nineties and early two thousands. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, we, as a group, we ended up after the first matrix, we just kept working with um, Lana and Lily because there was just this mutual respect and trust in terms of the filmmaking process. It's just that now there's so many companies that do it. The budgets are tight. Visual effects is such a huge part. It's just evolved to be you know, a large percentage of the pixels and any blockbuster are, are digital at this point, that um, that level of involvement with the visual effects companies just isn't quite, it's just not quite the same. That's one of the reasons why, not to take this all over the map in a discussion, but one of the reasons that we were driven in the engine to get real-time technology into that place is that I, w I, f I felt that the the spontaneity that, that you would have you know, with physical effects or physical traditional shooting sort of gone and visual effects become this very convoluted, complex process. Mm -hmm. And you'd find yourself, you know, you supervise, yeah. So you find yourself on a set and you could tell half of the crew were like, what the beep are we doing? This doesn't make any sense. And, you know, you try your best to get the green screen coverage or blue screen coverage right. And then the yeah. director's changing his mind when he frames it. You're like, you're shooting off the green screen and everybody's looking at you. And it's just this weird, like, they just think of us as, 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 as aliens that are on the set. And then iteration is really slow. I think the visual effects company's pipelines have got better and better, but you know, it's still an overnight turnaround for most shots to make tweaks and you can't really do it in front of the director's eyes. And I just felt that that industry is, is almost like um, um, out of respect to my previous job and the fact that I think that all media types are gonna converge over the next decade. I thought, well, let's, let's, let's see if we can help. And it really did, you know, it wouldn't have really, I don't think we would have had such adoption without John Favreau's help. And, you know, if you go to, the, if you go to any of these LED volume stages and particularly with Mandalorian at the beginning, you just see a crew that is like visual effects and lighting and everybody's together as one. And the, the results are instantaneously in front of their eyes. And it just so much more context. And it's like, finally, respect for visual effects They're like they're considered to be a normal part of the crew and somebody you can rely on to make awesome stuff as you're making the film with everybody who's the normal crew's present even though i think there's been a bit of a, a darker period although that you know the industry's booming is ma making lots of money and everybody's busy i think that finally the visual effects teams are beginning to be respected as a super deep integral part of the creative process even at the beginning of the film you know you look at previs now 
And it's so good. It's it's so good what they can do when they're previously in the engine that it helps the director actually make those choices. It means there's a good template. And because it can be connected to motion capture and live camera work, you can have spontaneity in your previs now. So I, sure. I actually think that even though it the scale is scary, the deadlines are scary, the budgets are tight, I think I see a glimmer of a revolution that really is just going to make the industry much more harmonious and fun to work in. It's, it's really exciting because you're right. Like I, I remember even going back to the 90s, I, the only time I go to sleep is when I hit render and the estimated render time is is what I'd set for my alarm clock. You know, essentially you're in a sleep while you're rendering and you're going to wake up and keep iterating. And, you know, I, I think it was kind of like comparing 3D to, let's say, someone in a flame suite who's mm -hmm. going to sit there with a client in real time and work in action and knock out shots. I got excited about virtual production purely for the concept that it wasn't post anymore. Suddenly mm -hmm. you're getting people in who are VFX, but it's for pre-production, but you're also on set. So it means mm -hmm. that you get to collaborate instead of this hypothesis of, um, hey, like it could look like this. You could actually work with other creators in brainstorming what they wanted in real time versus it being a, well, use your imagination and we'll come back in three months. Yeah, you know, and they also see your challenges. Like used to be the, because you know, it's sea of green, they don't care. They don't care what's there or the fact that lighting isn't really going to match what you're going to put there in the background. Or, but now they see it. It's like, oh, and and the, you know the great thing about the LEDs is that even though there are some technical challenges um, in terms of the amount of light they can make and the ratios that you can get out of them and the color accuracy, they do. They, it sort of brings together the traditional DP because they always add a little bit of extra light, get a bit of extra kick, get a bit, little bit of skin tones. And it, 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 you can see the visual effects team, you know, my friend Richard Bluff, you could just see him and the DP and the production team, they're, they're really are really a team. And it's not the usual, well, that's your budget. Let's just throw it over the fence and not worry about it until post-production when half of the production has gone at that point. Your problem at this point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kind of curious, like for you, as you decided to migrate from LucasArts, let's say, over to Epic, like, what was the selling point for you in terms of the, the vision? Like, for you, like, what got you really excited? Obviously, you could see that that's the future, but just kind of pivoting from one industry to the other, like, what was the deciding point for you to go to to Epic? For at least two decades, I'd seen that at some point, the real-time computer graphics business would overtake the traditional software business because, you know, Moore's Law says it's going to do eventually, and at some point you hit photorealism with software rendering, and you know, there's no more photo real than photo real. And we're, you know, we're getting close on the visual effects side, the traditional side. We're getting very, very close now at this point. In fact, if anything, I think innovation has died. I think there's more work, and I think actually some of the amazing work that's being done in the AI field by Nvidia and all the other academic people mm -hmm. will help fix that last five percent. You've already seen the deep fake stuff make a massive difference to digital doubles. Um, but it, it was obvious that okay, the problems are almost solved in visual effects, traditional visual effects with software rendering. The graphic stuff is getting more and more powerful. Um, Epic has an open piece of software that's available to anybody. And that Tim's philosophy at that point, when, when I was talking to them was like, we're just gonna give it out for free for anybody to use. And only we'll only make money out of it, you know, when they sell a product that, that uses the engine in direct consumer engagement. And I'm like, the potential for this thing to change the entertainment industry across the board was yeah. so clear. And I'd seen even with what we were doing at Lucas Lucasfilm, um, um, but even post Disney acquisition, you could see that it was going to change everything. And I'm like, well, do I do it here in a proprietary fashion that I can't really share? All I can do is share it with audiences. I can't share it with other creators. Or do I go and pioneer this or help be part of pioneering this at Epic that really is about giving this to millions and millions of people in a way that is so transparent and honest. And I, I know it sounds like I'm doing a big advert for Epic, but you know, anamorphic depth of field. We needed anamorphic squeeze on depth of field. We haven't put it in the engine. It hasn't been a super priority for us, but I know everybody wants it in the cinematic field. So this week I go to one of our graphics people that was kindly uh, offered uh, offered to help out. And last night he checked in into GitHub, his uh, code changes and straight away the community lights up. Hold on, we just saw this anamorphic. We're not even, we've not even fully tested it ourselves. And yet people are using it in the outside world. And it's that, it's that, it's that connection to Pretty much every artist on the planet at this point you know the amazing work that um, the team has done with lumen and, and nanai sort of bridges the gap between the two industries it's just I, yeah it's awesome I just, it, it, it is so obvious why i would come here because i just didn't feel that i could push things as quickly as i could here i think we've done a, a great job what we do need is more creatives like john favreau that really 
really yeah. have a vision of the kind of storytelling they want to take and to tell and how they want to make it. Um, but that'll happen. You can see right now, there's a whole new generation of filmmakers that are, are going to be wired completely different from the previous generation. Looking at all the stuff that's being done in filmmaking and game development, like what are some of the things with real time or specifically Unreal Engine that you've seen that are kind of take you by surprise that are quite innovative and completely different to the standardized stuff that everyone else is doing? Every day, every, time, every week we get something that we've never seen before. You know, years ago, NASA training their astronauts for the International Space Station was like, what? You're doing what? That's awesome. So it, there's, there's, there's loads and loads of stuff. I, you know, I, one of the, the most awesome stories that we've had um, is there's, a, there's an artist, quite a secretive artist called Kula, that um, at the very beginning of Unreal Engine, um, going on its journey of being very accessible to everybody, being effectively open source, and um, and heading towards being free, they, he, this, this artist put out these this sort of arch viz. It was like the first arch viz thing seven seven and a half years ago. I think it was August 12, two thousand and fourteen. <laughs> um, the only reason I remember that date is my wedding anniversary, so, so it's easy to remember the date. Yeah. Um, it. it was the first epic, and it went viral. And we're like, oh my god, look how good the pixels are we can make with the engine now, and what would could we make better? But then mm. he's like, well, like, hey, do you want to do some stuff for us, like? promote Archbiz or do some other cool stuff. And he's like, no, I'm going to make a game. I'm going to make a video game. And, it, and, and I'm like, you are? Yeah, I'm going to make a video game about a cat. And th that game is Stray. And it's come out oh. and it's been a monster success. And a lot of people were like, that's a game about a cat. That's stupid. It's not good. It's like, I don't know. A lot of people really like cats. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, dog, we're dog people ourselves. But <laughs> it's, uh, that's one of the most more exciting, awesome things that this little indie developer formed a team of people and has made this mega successful thing. And his art is, you know, motion picture quality. It was the stuff that really got visual effects companies, his early work to like, oh my God, you can do that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that was one of the most exciting bits. I texted my wife, she's in Canada right now. And um, yeah, she's a cat person and we'd seen things on YouTube about Stray. And then a lot of my friends are mentioning it like, oh, it's really good. And yeah, I watched some reviews, I haven't played it, but um, I, I actually texted her like a week ago, like, hey, that cat game, apparently it's like the number one game out there right now. Who would have thought when you think it's just a simple concept, but there it is, like doing something innovative and having the the willingness to follow through and get it out yeah, the door. And, I think it's amazing. and I'm sure, you know, we gave him one of our, before Mega Grants, uh, we had these developer grants, he had a grant to help him at the beginning, but it was obviously, it was a super indie thing and he persevered mm. and he did it. So for us, in the interactive space, it's like it's the ultimate hero story. It's like you have a dream, don't take, don't, don't let people dissuade you from doing it, and just get on with it. And if you really, if you work hard and you have an awesome idea, there's a, there's a really good chance you can make it big. So, yeah, that's that's one of the best moments of the last few years. That's great. How difficult is it to keep your finger on the pulse these days with new technology, new innovations, things like that coming out compared to like 20, 30 years ago? You get like a shareware disc of new programs, things like that on a, on a PC magazine. But these days, like everything is moving so quickly. Like where do you put your attention to keep up to date with what's going on? You know, I pay attention to occasional blogs and, and uh, you know, internet sites that have stuff. But honestly, it's mostly my network of friends. Like I have so many friends at so many different industries and everybody's taken a journey since the Matrix movie, not everybody's staying in motion pictures. It's just things, if you have a nice, net, a great network, you, you can learn stuff that's important. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of you know, stuff that maybe never ever becomes important that's out there and a lot of hype. So I tend to stay away from the hype stuff and sort of rely on my network of people that have learned cool things or seen cool things. I try not to um, over worry about competition or taint my view of where I think the future is by looking at what other people are doing. It, it's funny, it's very easy to get into that trap where you just worry about the competition all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never, I've never really done that. Just have an awesome team, believe in the team, give them a bit of slack. They always, they won't always get it right, but they will eventually. 